the X that can give us a clue what is more operational or less operational. So the ligand that is attached to the metal precursor. And we've seen that for metathesis, the X should be a very basic ligand. So if we have a methyl group, a hydride, um, something of that kind, sigma bond metathesis is a very, very likely process. So with this four center four electron uh, transition state. Another very important X factor are acetates and carbonates. Acetates in particular can provide access to this six-membered transition state, which favors electrophilic substitutions. So where the proton becomes very acidic and the acetate has a dual role. It has, on one hand side, it acts as a ligand to the metal. On the other hand side, it acts as a hydrogen bond donor and eventually as a base to abstract the proton. So you get this favored six-membered transition state where the acetate clicks, where the double bond moves from one side basically to the other one. So if acetates, carbonates are accelerating reactions, we're having another indicator that probably this is an electrophilic substitution. Yeah. So we see in many cases, if we think the metal is, uh, um, is electrophilic, acetate helps to do the job. So if you have troubles in getting cyclometallation, you have an electron poor transition metal, use acetate. Then the stability of the product. And there's maybe two factors uh, so that we can discuss a bit together. That's the activity of the CH bond or the, the reactivity of the CH bond and the, um, uh, the, the um, uh, the stability of the product. And there we have two aspects. So one is the um, size of the metallocycle. Five-membered metallocycles are typically preferred over six and four-membered. And these are preferred over larger and even smaller rings. And I'm saying this is preferred. So this gives us predictable guidelines, but it doesn't exclude. So we know that uh, we know of three-membered metallocycles, uh, which is really C, heteroatom, metal. Uh, cyclopropyl, a metallocyclopropyl type system. They're stable. They can be formed. But by far the most stable are five-membered rings. Five-membered, this is a bit different from organic chemistry where six-membered rings are the most stable. And that's of course due to the fact that the geometry around the metal center is different from the geometry around the carbon. Each carbon likes to have either 109 or 120 degrees, but the metals are more in the 90 degree angle. So that shrinks the ring and makes the, the ring smaller, the most stable ring small. So that's why five member rings are more favorable. And here you see examples that underpin this. So if we cyclometallate this phosphine system here, we have a, a close by bond here, a close by CH bond here and here. But this one here would form a six membered metallocycle, this forms a five membered metallocycle. There we go. This is the preferred product. Now we have the same here, so this is not hybridization dependent. If we have the phosphine directly linked to the aromatic system, so we remove that CH2 group, then we can form here a four-membered cycle and here a five-membered cycle, and it's the five-membered we get. Uh, so typically, typically five-membered rings are by far the most stable, so that's what will be formed. And here you see uh, a distinction of hybridization. So this phosphine here cannot form a, a five-membered metallocycle. It only can form four-membered metallocycles, but it can do this in two different ways. Uh, so we have two different positions that give four-membered metallocycles. So this would give one metallocycle that is four-membered, this would give another one. So we can distinguish in this system um, the hybridization effect. And you'd see that it's always the sp2 carbon that is activated and not the sp3 carbon. This is largely due to acidity effects, not bond dissociation energies. Bond dissociation energies would be lower for alkyl CH bonds than for excuse me, aromatic CH bonds. So one has to be careful to use 
Bond Dissociation Energies as a guideline. Or if you use Bond Dissociation Energies, look at the full package. Don't look only at the bond to be activated, but also at the bond to be activated in the metal precursor and the bonds to be formed, both the metal carbon bond and the hydrogen X bond that is formed. Uh, we cannot look only, zoom in on one case. It's the package, it's the sums that play a role. And so a uh, metal carbon SP2 bond is much, much more stable than a metal carbon SP3 bond. So this outweighs the dissociation energy differences in the precursor. So the CH bond can as well be activated or less activated by um, ligand structures or by constraints in the substrate, if you like. So here, are, uh, a, cis, here is a system, a quinoline system, that has um, a methyl group on the uh, benzene ring and different functionalities here on the R group adjacent to the nitrogen. And here we can see how this group here affects the cyclomethylation course. So if this is a imine, the imine is forming a coplanar system with this pyridyl ring. So if they're both chelating to the palladium, the transligand gets constrained with this sp3 CH bond. So this group clashes and the metal can resolve that case by either dissociating from the NN cleavage, uh, from the NN cleft, or it activates the CH bond and you get the CH activated metallocycle. If this is a methyl group, the whole coordination around palladium is different because now the palladium square plane is not coplanar with the quinoline, but it becomes orthogonal uh, because the acetates want to escape that methyl group. And as a consequence, this CH3 group doesn't get activated. So whether you get cyclomethylation of this CH bond or not is distinctly dependent on that R group. If this is a CH2 phosphine, then you remove that coplanarity and you get chelation, but the coordination plane is similar to the methyl group, so you get a stable compound, chelated, but no CH activation. Similarly, you can instigate or you can, um, you can uh, uh, um, stimulate CH activation by multi-topic bonding. And you'd see this in this example here down, when the palladium, uh, typically if, if, if you just use a palladium, uh, a phosphine alkyl system with palladium, you don't get cyclomethylation because these are only sp3 CH bonds that are difficult to activate. But if the phosphines can chelate, then this middle CH bond gets very close to palladium, and because of the steric proximity, you start activating that bond. So you get these metallocycles here, along as well with some coordination oligomers or polymers. So the CH bond, tip, there's one thing is the activity through hybridization, and the other part is whether we can somehow geometrically, with ligand constraints, bring that CH bond closer or less close to the metal. And so we can enhance the reactivity or lower the reactivity. And this plays a role for a number of catalytic reactions. For example, Greg Fu's uh, palladium phosphine system, this tertiary butyl phosphine system, is super active in cross coupling reactions. Um, we have to be careful that we put the conditions right. So, one thing is that in many cross coupling reactions, we form HX. We try to minimize the effect of HX by adding a base. But still, this is covered HX, so if we have an acid there, this can cause cyclometallation because the palladium can do oxidative addition uh, as palladium zero in the presence of HX to give this cyclometallated product. This is not so much a problem because with a base, uh, with, with, with a, uh, we can, this, this can be reversed. It won't be reversed if the phosphine dissociates, then we get dimers and these dimers are a sink they become so stable that the reaction holds. So this is why we have to use a base for these cross couplings and we should add a slight excess of phosphine to move anything that ends up in this dimeric structure and to, to put it out again to form this diphosphine system and then cleave the metallocycle again. So we keep catalytic activity there. 
So that's why many palladium complexes need not one equivalent of phosphine, but an excess of phosphine to have proper cross coupling. And then we can apply this, so we can move this a step further. And that's, uh, can we use this for organic synthesis? Can we use this for functionalization? And this has been uh, um, uh, termed in early days uh, to be some directed automethylation. It has been uh, done with metals that have a very low carbon metal bond stability. So especially lithium and other early transition metals, magnesium, have been used for this. So very hard metals together with the soft carbon, poor stability, so we can do further reactivity. We see this is not needed and we can do now nice chemistry as well with rhodium, ruthenium and the likes. So here the cyclometallation is transient and the metal cycle is not stable at all. But the metal cycle is seminal to direct the methylation and the functionalization. So here you have a functional group, this oxygen here that directs the lithium in butyl lithium. So it, it forms a complex with, with the lithium and this directs the butyl group close to that CH bond. We form butane and the lithium binds to the carbon. This is not stable and as soon as we add an electrophile of whatever sort, we functionalize this carbon here and we functionalize it selectively in ortho position. And this is not ortho because of electronic effects in the aromatic ring, like in aromatic substitutions, but this is ortho because of this long pair here. This long pair directs the whole process. And this has been studied in a variety of cases, and you can see that the ortho directing ability is, um, is di directly um, uh, consistent with the hardness of the directing group and the feasibility of forming stable metallocycles. So this uh, sulfonite system here has of course more oxo-anion structures because the SO bond is very polarized, so this is a very hard oxygen. This is the strongest donor, it can as well form a five-membered cycle, and then as you go further to the right, the more the groups become, uh, the less the groups become stable or uh, make stable, uh, the less hard the stoner groups are, so the less stable the interaction with the butyl lithium is, and the more you get sterically directing groups of uh, methylation. And you can imagine, you know, if you think of So this is a donating group. If you do electrophilic aromatic substitution in the unsubstituted system, so if you look at this guy here, then we know this is ortho para activating. So we get substitutions here. If we add an acetate group, we protect the ortho positions, we get selective substitution here. So this is the electronic pathway we expect. If we use the butyl lithium and we use it, so for orthometallation we use this group here, then we get selective substitution here if this is a good chelator or a good bind, a binding site for lithium. So you invert the classic, or you, you change the classic mode. This one here is a spontaneous electrophilic substitution. This one is the one where you use a metal that directs, that is directed by the lone pair of the oxygen. So those guys here on the left, they would be sterically shielding, typically would go para, but if you use orthometallation, they go ortho. And then the less directing this is, the more you get just the electrophilic um, uh, distinction, the more you get para products. So you can start functionalizing and you see here is an example where you have two different ortho directing groups and this one would be electron withdrawing, so this would be meta-directing, deactivating, 
This one here is a donor group. This would be orto para directing activating. So in both cases, so both functional groups would favor activation at this and this position if you just add an electrophile. But because this is a weaker directing group than this one here, if you use the metal-assisted process, you get selective functionalization in ortho position of the uh, azyl compound. So we can use this and we can, depending, if we just use the electrophile, we functionalize one side. If we use a lithium reagent, we uh, functionalize the other side. So it's orthogonal to classic organic chemistry, if you like. And then we can do much more. Because once we have the metal there, and if the metal has certain stability, we can use it as a um, platform to do further reactions. This doesn't work with lithium, because the lithium carbon bond is not stable enough, so we can basically just quench it. But with ruthenium, rhodium, iridium, and that's where you see the recent literature, we can start doing chemistry on the cyclometallated product, which is nice, which opens new doors. Now, JAX and Angewandte are full of those CH activation literature. You'd see, you'd see I'd, I'd bet 98 to 99% are the same of what Murai discovered 25 years ago and published in Nature. I think it was seminal, it is an absolute hallmark paper. The concept then is all reproducing. I am quite stunned that the, you know, once you have a nature paper, you've set the tone, and that's good. But that then still 25 years later, you get for very similar chemistry, still jacks after jacks, and it's not Murai, yeah? it's all the other guys. No, it's nice. Okay. Maybe, so if you want to have a jacks paper, you shouldn't stop, uh, you shouldn't do our organometallic chemistry. You should do. <laughs> but then I tell you, jacks is not everything. Sometimes it's much nicer to have, a, to have more of an understanding anyway. So, what did Murai do? He used this pyridyl amine system and a ruthenium catalyst, and the ruthenium is in the ruthenium zero state, so has low coordination, it's a cluster. Every dimetallic, trimetallic system is basically a surrogate of a free coordination site. Huh? Any bimetallic system, if you add a donor group, the dimetallic uh, cleavers and you uh, start entering chemistry and nice chemistry. So here what happens, the ruthenium coordinates to the, the ruthenium zero is soft, coordinates to the softest point. We know this is pyridine and not the amine. So then the ruthenium gets loaded with electron density, so prone to oxidative addition. Uh, ruthenium zero is nucleophilic, you get oxidative addition. Check out which uh, CH bonds can be oxidatively added. Look at your five-membered ring. Uh, so the only five-membered system here can be formed when we add, oxidatively add this benzylic CH bond. That's what happens. So you get this cis configuration uh, of the H and the carbon. I didn't draw here all the carbonyls. You just fill up the coordination sphere with carbonyls. Ruthenium has five or six coordination numbers, so you know, you add two or three carbonyls if needed. What happens next? The olefin coordinates to the ruthenium, so olefins are similarly backbonding to carbonyls. Often we can interchange those two ligands. So the olefin binds, we have the ruthenium hydride, the ruthenium alkyl bond, and now we can have two events. A, that the olefin inserts into the ruthenium hydrogen bond, or the olefin inserts into the ruthenium carbon bond. I think the mechanism hasn't been elucidated to that end. I think it's too quick. I've pos I, I just drawn you one case here. The other one it gives you the same result, just with a different intermediate. So if you insert, if this olefin inserts, you get this ruthenium dialkyl species, which is not stable, rapidly um, reductively eliminates, and you form this new carbon-carbon bond here. So you alkylate this carbon here you form the alkylated product, form back the ruthenium in low valence oxidation state, which can insert, again, coordinate to the imine, and you close the cycle. Turns to be very efficient. It works, and it works, and it works. Now, the same happens for very similar compounds. If you do this, 
if you work along this compound here, you get, you know, you have a similar five-membered metallocycle that you can form. You can add, you can change your structure, you can even carbonylate. So if you insert, if you do this under carbonyl pressure or for CO pressure, you have at this stage here, first the carbonyl that inserts. Now, I recall, uh, I'd like to remind you that for carbonyls, it's definitely not this process, but the carbonyl inserts in the metal alkyl bond. Uh, carbonyls never, ever insert into metal hydride bonds. That does not happen. The, the orbitals are not correct for having this to happen. Uh? So all hydroformulations never would work if there is formula bonds formed. So the COH does not form. And this can then be, do I have some, no. This can then be expanded to all types. So this, this portion here can then be expanded to all types of different uh, structures. We don't have to stick with olefins. Any electrophile can be added here. It binds to the metal, it reductively eliminates, and you can functionalize whatever bond. This has been done. I should have inserted those slides, I forgot. can be done then with a variety of electrophiles. One of the, so you can form you can form carbon halide bonds you can car form carbon oxygen bonds carbon carbon bonds carbon fluoride bonds, like here, typically the electrophile. The electrophile here is typically n chlorobromo iodo succinimide, uh, which is a source for oxygens, um, the typical electrophile is periodates, so idenium salts where you have basically electrophilic oxygens. For carbons, well, the floor is yours, there's plenty of electrophilic carbons from alkyl halides to whatever. Uh, for fluorides, well typically there's these. Fluorine salts that are provide electrophilic fluoride. We also have like Such is high valent iodide salts would give us carbon-carbon bonds, aromatic carbon-carbon bonds. And we have the same for so this is typically a that's a mess now a chelating iodinium salt that then uh, can dispatch CF3. 
so we can literally coordinate any type of functional group with this type of mechanisms. Maybe I can show you early this afternoon. Huh? So, but there's principally with the, this functionalization works extremely well if the metal has some residence time. Uh, with lithium, with magnesium, uh, with the early transition metals, we don't have this. As soon as we get uh, a reasonably stable metal carbon bond, and that is with late transition metals much more the case, we can start functionalizing. One thing, and then you get all types of, if you look at this cyclonet, uh, if you look at all the CH functionalization that is out there, you realize that uh, a lot, a lot, a lot dwells on these type of, of um, activities. And some is very surprising. But then once you start looking at it, it's not all that surprising. So for example, um, Sanford recently had a paper out where she showed that that you can functionalize um, aminocyclohexanes in a very remote position. And that's very nice. You know, that's a functional group transformation that you can do, that, 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 is, that is very remote, that, that seems very useful. So, I would have hoping, or I would be hoping that you understand that mechanism very easily by looking at that compound. Now you have to do a bit of a mental twist in your head, but then I'm sure you have no problem in, in, in rationalizing the whole thing. So how can a metal, how, 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 how would that far away position be activated? This chair? Okay, you're, you're almost there. And now we understand. That palladium has to see that CH bond. Yeah? Doc. That makes total sense. You get cyclometallation, you get this uh, uh, palada nitrogen carbon cycle. You form a very nice one, two, three, four, five met membered metallocycle. Perfectly, all fine, all easy. It has to. You quench it with the electrophile and you get selective functionalization, one side only. And depending on your substitution pattern, you can of course access, you can enhance or reduce the stability of this boat. And then it doesn't work anymore, or it works faster. So, looking at the chem draw, it looks complicated, considering what it is, makes total sense. And you'd see many of those papers, not of these, but they're using in a very creative manner, exactly the Murai type style. You form a reasonably stable metallocycle, you can do everything. You can add here an electrophile under CO pressure, you carbonylate. You add an electrophile, no carbonyl, you just add the electrophile. You can fluorinate cyclohexylamines, you can uh, uh, iodide, and you can play the whole game. And it's nice because it works with different transition metals, so in some cases you can use nickel, so then you get into the more sustainable field and everything becomes greener, and you get there. So I'll do, again, I'd like to spend the afternoon a bit more on exercising, so I'll put up a few exercises on this cyclometallation, but as well on the functionalization, Take it if you like it, we can discuss it through and uh, we'll go through. Sometimes uh, the mechanism is not totally trivial and I end up here just with this one slide where um, 
where we have different different reactivities. So here we get with tantalum we get a cyclometallation eventually, which forms this oxygen carbon oxygen tridentate system. And it turns out that they could in isolate this bidentate coordinating compound. But when they looked at it carefully, they see that actually um, you form you form first this oxo hydroxo system here as a coordination product which undergoes cyclometallation. And deuterium experiments showed that there is a faster metathesis between the CH bond and the tantalum than between the OH bond and the tantalum. So that's quite quite specific because you'd expect that the OH bond is super acidic should go faster. So probably it's here the geometry constraints that make this CH activation faster than the OH activation. So you have cyclometallation here that is even faster than protonolysis which is supposed to be one of the fastest reactions. So that's more a special case, nothing to uh, build a, a, a proposal on, but just there are cases where cyclometallation is fast. There are even cases where cyclometallation doesn't occur, even so it seems that it occurs. But actually you get direct CH activation. We'll see this later. Okay, so I think we close here. It will, bell will ring. We do um, uh, some exercises on cyclometallation. Hopefully we develop the field a bit further this afternoon. Yeah? Thank you indeed for joining in. I was uh, surprised by I had a lot of today I didn't know of. Uh, that started very late, so uh, it was a bit out of control. There were like 30 or 40 people in the room, so I couldn't really tell them, no, I don't call my name, call now and so, so apologies, that wasn't great. Um, and I'm glad I didn't have a sandwich before, because otherwise I had two lunches in a row, that would be a bit too much. Anyway, so... <laughs> We're back to where we should be. Uh, so we just do the exercises a bit faster. So you have to go, 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 and then we catch in the time. So I put two, three examples down there that, that where we can possibly, maybe we can even start with a different one, which would be more like a, um, so more like the basics. Um, let me see whether I find it. Maybe we can start with this one as a as a warm up. So you guys there can do the tantalum. You guys do the palladium, and then we exchange. So we'd like to cyclometallate. That precursor. We have either palladium acetate or the, the pentamethyl tantalum on the shelves. The question is which bond gets activated? Can we know something about transition states intermediates? So not that this is an industrially relevant molecule, huh, but that's more for uh, really getting practice of what can happen and what can't happen. And you let me know whether that's dead easy, whether that's a bit of a challenge. Do you remember the five rules? Oh, no, this is not an exercise about learning by heart, so maybe...
are the five components we need to keep in mind. Which is the best donor? What's the nature of the metal? It's electron density, it's quality. Can we decide already a bit what mechanism is likely? X, what does the X in the metal precursor um, suggest as a potential mechanistic course of the reaction? Then look at the substrate. Are there any five-membered rings we can form? Preferably, otherwise four six-membered, that may be likely too. Or do we have to go more straight? And then finally, is there a bias of sp2 versus sp3 hybridization for bond activation? sp2 faster than sp3. There's even room for a third opinion, so you know it's always good to have. You guys have the same? Okay, go show me. What's here? For the tantalum, you don't have the same, or for the palladium? You guys have the same for the palladium? Or it's something different? Put it down. Go and put it down, the palladium. What's your, you have to say, you have to turn the palladium or the tantalum? No, actually in palladium, he told, is it possible for this that C and can form a pincer type of thing? I don't know, put it down. The more we have, the more we can discuss. Your space.
if you want to correct. Okay. Do we start with the palladium? Because maybe we have more solutions for the palladium than for the tantalum, or do you want to put some more tantalum structures down? So, we can look at this maybe qualitatively first at the suggestions. Huh? I take this is two different ligands, right? So we have one, two, three, four, that's palladium four, huh? This is four coordinate. Palladium four. This is three coordinate. Palladium zero, one, two. Yeah? Same here. Who has worked with palladium? Who has used palladium in his, her life? Who has done never a cross coupling? Never a cross coupling. What's, what's the palladium oxidation states that are common? I say, yes, we get everything if we try hard enough, but what, is the, what are the normal palladium oxidation states? Plus two, zero, plus four. Huh? Yes, common? One, one. One, one. Yeah. Very rare. Palladium three, yes, very rare. Uh, so ninety percent palladium two, maybe eighty. Then some palladium zero, but we discover it immediately. Palladium zero. Palladium four. Have you seen palladium four? So what geometry? What coordination number? Palladium zero. Four, three. Uh, because palladium zero is so electron rich, not too many ligands. Mostly palladium three. Uh, so coordination number three, sometimes four. Hmm? So like the styrene, palladium styrene is, has three styrenes. Palladium tetrakis phosphine we know, but one phosphine goes before we see it. So as soon as you dissolve it, one phosphine is free. But yes, four, three. Palladium two, Always four, square plunge, always. Palladium four? Six. six, mostly six. So we have to engineer here a bit. Uh, we have three and four coordinate. The four coordinate probably is six coordinate. The three coordinate probably is four coordinate. Now we can do this, uh, but we have to do it. And the easiest is to somewhere have a chelate. And the second easiest is to Make it a dimer, done. Huh? Now this is a palladium very common motive. Now it can also keep. Yes, it rarely does. Most of the time it does this. High oxidation numbers, yes. So we see this with iridium-3, rhodium-3 occasionally. Um, but it's a off. This is only about 60 degrees. So for a square plane, very squeezed. So that's why the dimers often are um, more comfortable. Okay, so we've 
sorted that one. So now we have four options. Huh? So this one here, like that. No, Say? It's not. It's, it's not bad energy. Huh? Three coordinate. <laughs> Three coordinate. Not so nice. Huh? Anyway. We can think of plenty of possibilities. We can go, so this is more, this was more a, like a validation of, this, of the product. Eh? So are they sensible or not? Is it, what is happening? I think we just go through the algorithms. Nature of the donor group. We know which one is the softest, which one is the hardest. Hard, second. Soft, softest, yeah? So we all agree, palladium first has to bind to the phosphine, yeah? Nature of M, palladium, electrophilic, nucleophilic, um, low D count, almost no D electrons. Palladium electrophilic, always. <laughs> So, we know binding to phosphine that's because it's palladium 2 then the nature of the anion involved acetate Acetate has this click click roll that helps an acidic proton to remove. So that kind of confirms or fuels the electrophilic road even more. Yeah. Metallocycle size. Five membered. We look at the ligand. So one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, five. One, two, three, four, five, five. So we have three positions to consider because all the others are carbon-carbon bonds and carbon-carbon bonds we haven't discussed yet that we haven't discussed because carbon-carbon bond cleavage is a tough game. A very tough game. Okay? So now comes the reactivity of the CH bond. Uh, that's our last one. So that's SP2 goes better than SP3. So that basically eliminates that position here. So we have two SP2 bonds. So now we need to go back to the mechanism. Electrophilic, so what should be the electronic ideal situation on the arene or on the carbon to be activated? Electron rich, electron poor. Electron rich, so we need to identify which of those two is electron richer. 
here we have a, a, basically an alkyl group donating. Huh? The nitrogen is too far away, it has a very, very minor effect. So this is an alkyl group, this is an alkyl group, balancing out. A cyano group, electron donating, withdrawing, withdrawing. Uh, alkoxy, a uh, hydroxy group, electron donating, withdrawing, donating. So this one, electron rich. Yeah? So, zoom, palladium here. So, this one less favored than this one. This one less favored than this one. This one, yes. More favored. So question is, do we have a second CH activation? As we have it here, uh, here we have a second CH activation, here we have a second CH activation. Hard to say. This one here, requires phosphine dissociation. <coughs> Not impossible, but it's the hardest bet because we said the phosphine is soft, the palladium is soft, so principally this is a very stable configuration. So I would say rather not. This one here brings in some strain with the five-membered metallocycles. Uh, if you think of how the ligand, how the arene has to adopt, you know, it has to get it to this agostic mode. So the flexibility is very limited by this chelate. So that makes it less likely. Also, you have two donor groups already there that are quite good donors. So the electrophilicity of this Sorry, the electrophilicity of this palladium is lower than the electrophilicity of uh, the palladium acetate. So you reduce, you lower the reactivity in principle. Um, this is extremely important if when you start looking at, when you make palladium complexes and you test them for cross-coupling. You see millions of papers where they make a nice complex, they use it for, uh, you know, they demonstrate that the compound is active in cross-coupling catalysis. Out of these million papers, all but a few, never ever compare their activity with that of palladium acetate. And they know why. Maybe they don't know why. Maybe they don't want to know. But you'd be surprised in how many cases the ligand deactivates the palladium and the acetate is much faster. Why is it? Because the palladium acetate is more electrophilic, so it reduces easier, so it goes. While with the strong donor groups around it, it's harder to get it to palladium zero, so uh, it's just less active. So you look at uh, most of the papers where they engineer, and you can even look at some of ours, we didn't do the test. So most often palladium acetate is nice. But then palladium acetate you cannot engineer much. So you know with a with a ligand you can start imposing selectivity and, uh, 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 and maybe activity still. But so with palladium we're happy. We probably stick it to here or we leave it here. Tantalum, the case is different, huh? so tantalum is so the nature of the donor groups, we already discussed what's the hard, what's the soft. Nature of the metal, tantalum is hard. How many D electrons? Zero. What mechanism likely? Huh? So tantalum five, D zero. Nature of X, methyl groups, 
extremely powerful sigma bond metathesis, okay? So, kind of confirmed. So the attachment point is the oxygen. In the first instance, by attaching, we lose one equivalent of methane. Then we have here a fairly irreversible bond with that. We locked the tantalum at this position, period. Yeah. So then we start constructing metallocycles. One, two, three, four, five, very nice. One, two, three, four, straight. One, two, three, four, five, impossible, two, five. So that's it. So, it's break time, we should stop. Okay, so. so, can this react further to here or to anywhere? You know, for a pincer compound to happen, the metal has to be able to make decent cycles, metallocycles. Huh? Five, maybe six membered. So, you see already how you have to draw your bonds here. There's something that looks like strain, like a lot of strain. Is the phosphorus tantalum interaction strong or weak? This is the softest in our whole series. Likely not so strong. Can we draw it somehow? You know, we have this oxygen here that puts basically the tantalum on this, ah, oh, the titanium, that's magic. The tantalum on this side. Can we get this phosphorus somehow to lean over? Not very well, because really the oxygen is pulling it one side, oh, on this side. So the phosphine is far away. So, sterically, this is very difficult. If this were an oxygen, maybe there is some but it would need to be an irreversible bonding. But you'd see that already this guy here, even in a pincer compound, there are some pincer compounds known. But you have a methylene in between. So that's two six-membered cycles. Now, in fact, this looks like, if you look at this from the side, this is not planar anymore, but the arms are looking in one direction, and so you can accommodate this CH2 group. This is very strained, and you can actually use this as a CH2 transfer agent. So that tells you how strained this is, this wants to go here. So that's how you get the CH2 exposed. So it's very difficult to make multiple CH activations or if you have the strain in the cycle, the other one won't. Okay. We'll have a cup of tea quickly and then we do one or two more where we go on more synthetic approaches. Is that okay? Or you don't want a cup of tea? Too warm. Let's go. Or we're too late. It's already gone. <laughs>